Hey, hey, how's it going? Take a seat, grab a drink, and make yourself comfortable, because we're talking about books today. So Monsters of the Week has been around for over two years now, and I still find it difficult to describe it in an elevator pitch. As in, what's the series actually about? Many people consider it a horror series, and even though a penchant for the dark and macabre is hard to deny, I personally never considered it a horror series myself. It's rather that horror is one of the most fertile areas to find topics in that emit the right spark. A central theme, a notion that connects not just video games but any kind of media to serve as a stepstone to explore literature, science, philosophy, poetry, religion, psychology, you name it. To be educational while also, hopefully, entertaining at the same time. So there is no real blueprint for what fits and what doesn't, it just has to feel right to me. Now not too long ago I got a comment on my channel asking me to give book recommendations about horror, philosophy and psychology. Thanks for that comment, Edouard Piche. And I thought this would serve as an excellent opportunity to chisel out a little bit of an emotional definition of Monsters of the Week through works that heavily inspired my ideas, thinking and writing as well as, hopefully, give you guys a handful of authors and literary works that are, in my opinion, highly worth checking out on its own as well. So, you know what, let's stop beating around the bush and get started. Songs of a Dead Dreamer by Thomas Ligotti If you're tying horror and philosophy together, there's probably no author who fits this combination better than Thomas Ligotti. I stumbled upon him by sheer accident, when I found myself rejoicing over Rustin Cole's Nietzschean monologues in True Detective. I went on researching Cole's character and what inspired the writers to come up with him, and found that the series creator, Nick Pizzolatto, had been repeatedly accused of plagiarizing the works of Thomas Ligotti. I'm kind of happy he did, because it made me check him out and give him a shot, and I didn't regret it. His style is often described as weird fiction, philosophical horror, and the Washington Post named him the best kept secret in contemporary horror fiction. He's written a handful of profoundly existentialist and oftentimes rather pessimistic non-fiction essays, as well as several novels and many tantalizingly haunting short stories over the last three decades, and if you're looking for a good entry point, I recommend you go with the compendium of his earlier short stories, Songs of a Dead Dreamer. Ligotti is subtle, cunning, and thoughtful in the way he orchestrates his narrative arcs. I often felt like he tells his stories almost like a good joke, carefully and precisely building up a card house of expectations only to almost sadistically crush it in a sudden and unexpected crescendo, only that it won't make you laugh but that it makes your skin crawl. In my eyes, he's a true master of cunningly establishing and subverting expectations. Pair that with an unbridled talent of distorting reality and the ability to weave his philosophy and worldview into words that just tend to strike a chord with me, and you have one of my favorite horror fiction authors of all time. Army of One by Junji Ito To viewers of Monsters of the Week, a recommendation of Junji Ito should hardly come as a surprise, but it's not avoidable. Ito is a true master of the uncanny and the eldritch, a conductor of unforgettable cosmic horror tales. His comics are known for spinning mundane, everyday things into the grotesque and macabre in a way that not just keeps you turning pages anxiously, but that lingers in your mind long after you put down his works. Ito has an instinctive grasp on how to break down our innermost fears and weave their very essence into relatable stories that make them palpable. Aside from the mangas I've covered in my videos, Uzumaki and the Enigma of Amigara Fault, one of my personal favorites is Army of One. In part because it feels a little more on the nose than most of his other works, which to me felt thoroughly positive in this case. At its core, Army of One deals with the issue of widespread social isolation in Japan, the disturbing trend of hikikomori, people who gradually lock themselves in their homes until they end up withdrawing from society for good. The topic is segued into through a series of grotesque murders, but it mostly uses this outline to gradually establish an air of inescapable seclusion, loneliness over solitude with the protagonists and the reader alike. The subliminal notion that events of an eldritch scale can drive us to abnormal social reclusion, resulting in the anxious compulsion to not let anyone too close, 
while at the same time desperately craving closeness and intimacy. It's a story with hauntingly relatable elements, especially for introverted people themselves. If you count yourself among them, you might even recognize parts of yourself in it. Army of One was released as a bonus story at the end of Ido's single-issue manga Hellstar Remina, which makes it a great opportunity to get two fascinating works full of grotesque body horror and eldritch abominations at once. Think on These Things by Yido Krishnamurti I got this book recommended by a friend and coincidentally stumbled upon a pretty ragged used copy of it on a flea market just two days later. And I'm happy I did because it quickly turned into one of my favorite pieces of bedside philosophy. The various, not directly related, chapters in this book were originally presented in the form of talks the author used to hold in front of students, teachers and parents all across India during his lifetime. But his words were so profound and impactful to an abundance of people that it got eventually compiled into a written compendium so that the merits of Krishnamurti's philosophies could spread and bring inspiration to thoughtful people everywhere. In this 272 pages long paperback, the Indian philosopher, speaker and author addresses on-the-nose questions about life, spirituality, ideology, emotion, ambition, greed and envy, education, religion, politics and tradition. Questions about the human nature itself, with lucid honesty, simplicity and his characteristic objectivity. Krishnamurti has a penetrating and profound way of addressing fundamental principles of human existence, often by simply posing the right questions or counter questions. And so think on these things turns out to be really what it says on the tin. It won't magically enlighten you and answer all your questions and worries for you, but it will give you a nudge in the right direction to help you explore new avenues of thought on your own. It gives you questions to consider and methods to employ to approach fundamental problems of life, but ultimately lets you come to your own conclusions. I've finished all the chapters quite a few times by now, but it remains refreshingly free of imposed ideology and spiritually invigorating. A great piece to pick up from time to time, to just read a chapter or three, to ignite a swirling miasma of tantalizing thoughts and turgid ideas in your mind. Okay, that was kind of pretentious. The Myth of Sisyphus by Albert Camus One of the most interesting phenomena in liberal arts to me is when two individuals approach a similar question independently from each other and with vastly different mythologies, but end up arriving at surprisingly similar conclusions. So in this spirit, we're jumping from Yido Krishnamurti to the French philosopher, journalist and author Albert Camus. Because those two couldn't have a more contrasting public image where Krishnamurti was considered an inspiring, warm-hearted and spiritually enlightening mentor figure, Camus is usually seen as almost the polar opposite. He is generally considered one of the bleakest and most depressing philosophers to date. But that usually comes from a deep misunderstanding of his core ideals when taking his most catchy quotes completely out of context. There is but one truly serious philosophical problem, and that is suicide. Judging whether life is or is not worth living amounts to answering the fundamental question of philosophy. Camus is often attributed labels like existentialism and nihilism, which he always vehemently objected during his lifetime. As he states in his essay, The Rebel, he devoted his life's work to opposing the tenets of nihilism while delving into the importance of individual freedom and propelling the rise of the philosophy of absurdism. The absurd refers to the conflict between the human desire to seek inherent meaning in life and the human inability to find any. It is a deeply agnostic school of thought in that it claims how the efforts of humanity to find inherent meaning are bound to fail and therefore absurd, as the overwhelming amount of information available as well as the vastness of the unknown makes acquiring certainty a practical impossibility. And while this notion, in and of itself, might appear profoundly disheartening in nature, it's Camus' rebellious attitude towards it that makes him so invigorating to read upon closer inspection. In his view, it is imperative to defy the absurd with every fiber of your being. 
And this is where he comes to uncannily similar conclusions as Krishnamurti, who too constantly stressed the need for a revolution of the psyche of every human being, while emphasizing that such revolution cannot be brought about by any external entity, be it religious, political, social or cultural. In that same vein, Albert Camus uses the Greek myth of Sisyphus as a stand-in for humanity's struggle with the absurd in his essay, The Myth of Sisyphus, in which he ultimately concludes that the struggle itself, itself is enough to fill a man's heart. One must imagine Sisyphus happy. If you've ever found yourself pondering about these kinds of philosophical questions and ended up in a dejected tears and rain soliloquy, then Camus' perspective on human existence might bring you some unexpected perspective, and maybe even solace. Who knows? Thank you guys for watching. I hope that one or more of these recommendations turn out to be interesting to you. If yes, you can find the book's ISBNs in the descriptions. Also, let me know in the comments what you think of little extracurricular bonus videos like these. This one, for instance, is something like a celebration thank you for reaching one of the most important milestones on my Patreon. So, as always, my thanks goes out to all the wonderful people who have been supporting me on there already and who pitched in when the channel was hit by YouTube's advertisement madness. You're literally the reason why I can keep doing this, so you deserve my deepest gratitude. If you want to help fund the channel too, then you're welcome to follow the link in the description to join my Patreon bunch. This month's special thank you goes out to these top tier supporters. Orcel Markison, Cory Laflamme, Quentin Prudhomme, James Lynch, Lucas, Thwagam, Jackson Brasil, Tony Flesher, Travis Deng, Evan Terkre, Kiris Darhaku, Adam Burr, Ian Oblivion, the Half Man, Nick Lazell, Christopher Nurigat, Matt Davis, Julia, David Nadeau, The Melting Squad, Simon Chomsland, Sean Quigley, Sean Holiday, Roman Wasenmüller, Nathan DeGrand, Dark Blue One, Alex Lake, Carlos Spilari, Siri Agnes Eliasson, Agustin Ortega, Jason Johns, Brand Rupert, Morrigan, Maxwell Brown, Subject Matter Games, Max Herbert, Nolani Telemoni, Bruce of Jones, James Lewis, David Zelenak, Karl Jura, Martin Schmidt, Konrad Kurze, Austin Berry, Sarah Thompson, Ryan Vieira, Adam Cross, Matthew Daly, Sonny Mellard, Mura Casardis, Michael Spina IV, Travis Leneve, Struggler, Jordan Farrell, Dennis Pfefferquan, Mr. Bergadon, Caroline Mills, Matthias Fowler, Decim, Rational User, Philip Kirchner, Midorino, Chase Ladner, Pascal Thaling, Milan Vujnovic, Yasin Inat, Andrei Kriakushin, Sebastian Garcia, Jacob Woodward, Dimitri Pirak, Luke Johnson, Denny Sendel, Chaco Pereira dos Santos Silva, Carlos Vega, Marisa Martinez, Michelle Stoliker, Christopher Collish, Nicholas Stevenson, and Ronnie Minot. Tata for now.